Uh, here we have Josh's Duo Sonic from Fender, and it's a well, it's about the best colour you can get, really. A blonde maple neck with a what do they call that thing? Mint green scratch plate and a sort of creamy butter creamy. No, I don't know. Arctic white or something like that. No, whatever colour it is, it's a lovely white finish, uh, off-white finish. But what a lovely looking guitar. Short scale thingy. Got quite a chunky neck on it. Um, as you can see, we're in close-up mode here. Yeah, hardly any sort of cut back in there. So almost the full width of the whole thing. I don't know, about 28 millimetres, whatever that adds up to me. I don't know what the board is they start out with, to be honest. But anyhow, we have Fender Duo Sonic. We've got strings that sound like, I don't know, elastic bands. I mean, not elastic bands, pieces of string tied up. That's got to be the, some of the deadest strings I have heard in a long time. Listen to this. So they're old. They could definitely do with a change. And we've got some, we've got some strings up there to change them too. Now, this guitar is in four. Sorry, I've got my creaky boots on today. It's going to creak all the way through this. I'm secretly, by the way, I am chuffed because I've just proved something. Yeah, well, one, one example isn't exactly proof, but there's been a long-winded discussion regarding cracks in neck pockets of guitars. And uh, I posted a long time ago um, on YouTube or a video on YouTube saying I thought... They were mostly, I thought, I suspected there were always wood cracks underneath the finish. And I got a lot of abuse um, saying, no, no, that's rubbish. And probably from people who want to sell them and or people who bought them with cracks and trying to persuade themselves there's no big deal. Now, I also recognise that the um, finish is very brittle on many guitars and it cracks quite easily. Um, da, da, da. Um, anyway, so I took an absolutely bog standard guitar body, which I was going to strip, well, I wasn't going to strip, but I'm going to repaint an old Indian made Sun, not Sun Mustang, Encore uh, strap body, um, which is hanging up in here. I'll just show you while I'm on the subject. Oh, excuse me, it's around here. Um, anyway, so I uh, I took this old thingy here and um, getting it, basically filling in a load of holes and, and filling some dents and kind of key it up a little bit. But while I was there, I stripped back this neck pocket area here and I have got some fantastic pictures. It had a crack there in the finish that anybody and their uncle would have sworn blind was um, not uh, definitely only in the finish they would say and um, so I stripped it back and I used uh, attached a sort of thing to the heel and bent it open a little bit in the vise and guess what I have got a dynamite picture of the exact same crack following the finish. It is absolutely in the wood and it's as clear as day. And yet the crack itself to begin with looked exactly like every single crack that everyone tells you is not in the wood. And it is damn well in the wood. And of course, nobody ever rips it apart and strips off the finish to do that check. Well, I happened to do it. And so one out of one, first time I did it to check like that, it proved that it was in fact in the wood after all. Right, let's just turn off the heater now because it's starting to get warm in here. It being April, but not exactly boiling. So what are we doing with this creature? Well, we're going to set a low uh, action. We're going to replace this with a Seymour Duncan hot rail. He wants a hot rail in there for kind of versatility. Loves the guitar, but wants a hot rail in the bridge to give it some spice. So that's going in there. We're going to put a tusk string tree instead of the metal one. Um, I'm going to take off the plate, obviously, to do the pickup change. I'm going to clean the bridge and everything because it's a bit mucky. And we're going to give uh, the frets a precision leveling. And um, a little bit difficult to tell at this point in time whether they are playing the way I want them to because they're, these are 11 gauge and they are quite, heav quite heavy, quite hard to bend even on a, a long scale, long short scale beastie like this. Um, just as a, an observation, I, this this um, guitar is one of those, that I th has it been sprayed up to and over? Yeah, probably. I'm looking, trying to look carefully and see. There's usually a tell telltale. It could actually be a, it's 
sprayed after, uh, sprayed first, fretted afterwards. Actually, I think it might be that way around, which is a bit unusual. Yeah, I think it is. That's more like the way I do it. Um, a lot more time consuming, I have to say. Anyway, um, so I've had a quick play of this. I, I do like these things. If the, I like the tone. This I think it's remarkably good con considering it's you know, two singles, um, but it's, I find it really a nice sounding guitar to play. But I totally get wanting a bit of extra harumph in the uh, bridge position. So tonight, um, the, the only real question I've got, oh, we're gonna put some new knobs on as well. Um, one of these is lost, so we're gonna replace the pair, but they look identical to this. But you'll notice some of these are a bit on the wobbly side, as is the jack socket, if you get a look at it. Um, and, you know, so we're tightening all that stuff up and we'll reposition this. It, it, on these, it runs forward to backwards usually, but this one's sort of diagonal. Um, the only, the only area that I have my usual sort of area of concern about is the nut. And I think, we oh, says using full zoom in balls. I think I'm gonna go on the, if it isn't broke, don't fix it basis with this guitar. Um, and because I think first of all, it is a tusk material. I'm pretty certain of that. And or a new bone. Um, so it should be already nicely lubricated. You can see the strings have been very carefully cut to sit uh, halfway down. In fact, it may still be a little bit too high. Woo, there. Don't blind. Look at that. that is a fantastic close-up camera. I can't hold it well enough to stop it shaking, but that's my blood in my veins going through my veins. But hey, if I don't do that, you can get a, a, a put down on the floor. Anyway, um, yeah, so I might just end up just uh, widening those up a tiny bit and getting them to the first fret height that I want. Um, on the basis that I don't really want to dig out, oh, I'm looking in the wrong place now. I don't I don't like to take out such a nicely fitted nut when as long as the I've got room to get the action to where I want it and it is a material like Tusk which helps us with the passage of the strings through the nut slot. So it will be if it isn't broke, I'm not gonna dig it out because there was always some risk of damage when you take a nut out and however carefully you do it um, so there we are all right so I'm going to zoom out of course if uh, I'm a bit too far out now if uh, if it becomes necessary if, for example that it isn't possible to get the action right then um, I will know let me put this in here I don't mind not a problem um, what's the word replacing the nut but we'll, we'll only do it on a needs basis. So I'm just gonna um, plug in the charger to this thing. And I'm gonna use the old iPhone, the old iPhone, the iPhone is to sort of zoom in. Close-ish up mid shot thing and the wider shots from this up there. Right, um, so to begin with, I guess I'll start with a a longish shot wherever I'm looking from. It's not actually that easy to see what's going on. If I get triangle over here, it's not it's an okay view, but I tend to get tangled up and then I also have to get my the old mirror out to see what I'm seeing. And then I have to get it there which then reflects everything else. But hey, never mind. Okay so look what I've done to begin with is I've done a little measurement here. And the, the low fret, low fret, last fret action on the low strings is about right. It's gone a bit mouldy up here, hasn't been played up there. Um, the, the, the high E is a bit high, it's at 1.8. And the relief is a little bit more than it needs to be at about 0.4, possibly 0.4 and a half, something like that, 0.45. Anyway, so obviously the, one of the things I'm gonna do is take it down. So if I just get me, get me a, thingamajig taking this down being a oh, I can't see what I'm saying I'm just gonna hope that zooms in a bit um, so I'm gonna take this down I think this is it's pretty much spot on um, but this is too high here well, let's take this down ah made in Mexico uh, give us an American adjuster thank you Okay, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at, yeah. it's nearly two, so it's too high. So I'll drop that down. 
and we'll see if it behaves on the frets underneath. Okay, 1.2, way too high. So what I tend to do is I tend to do a gradient, a spread of heights between the lowest on the high E side and uh, between that and the low E side. So if it's 1.5 on the low E and 1.2 on the high E, then I sort of work out a spread between. It's never completely accurate. It's always a little bit of a guess, obviously, because you know it's a fairly, a relatively crude method I'm using, but it sort of gets us there. And uh, not far off. I'll take all of this off afterwards and give it a good clean because it's a bit grimy. So it will freshen it up. Okay, so we're still a little bit over 1.5 there. Fubbity dub dub. Okay, let's just tune it for a minute. Tuned. Oh, that's quite a good shot. <laughs> God, it's so dead. Okie dokie. Right, I think what we should do is check and see if we can make a small adjustment to the um, truss rod as well while we're at it. Now I'm going to need my, oh no, it's going to be my Mexican style. I can never remember which one it is. I've got one marked up somewhere. This one's marked up. Well, it says Mexico strap, but I'm not sure that is the correct. And also it's a very short stumpy one, which won't fit in there. Uh, at least the same as that one. Maybe I should mark this up. So what I'll do is first of all, I'll move the strings as much as I can out of the way. And what we're gonna do, we're going to tighten it slightly if we can get and purchase. Ah, there we go. Very little room to make the adjustments, as you can see. I'm just going to give it two little 10 degree turns. And we shall wait and see. I'll give it a few minutes or a little while. Yeah, let's change that already. It's now, it's now fractionally too flat. That's a uh, very little adjustment required, so that's good. I like a much more direct truss rod than uh, any other option. Uh, getting a purchase on it is hard. Right. So that's one ten degrees back. So it should take us to about where I want it. Now that's interesting what's going on there. Well, that's, first of all it's hitting the pickup. That's the first thing so we'll take that down. So I can see that Josh has had this wound right up to get the most um, output from it. And uh, the lower action is now hitting the pickup cover. That's not the end, end of the world. So a quick check, that's about 0.2, that's good. Now, um, what I'll now do is check the first fret action heights. It could well be spot on. What I will do is, even if it's spot on, I will make sure that I widen them a little bit with the V file because the problem with this is um, the slots cut straight up uh, are often um, are often uh, a problem in that the strings kind of still get a bit of friction going on in there. So I reckon these are probably about four point four of a mil, a bit more than. So you don't really want them that high. They want to be about 0.3. Well, 0.4 if you're being conservative and nerdy. 0.3 if you're feeling crazy. So I'm going to take the V file and I'm going to gently run it into this 
slot and I'm tipping backwards and I'm just aiming to bring it down to 0.3 whilst just cleaning it and widening it slightly so it's a, it's a very small adjustment indeed but it'll, the idea is it will bring it down to the correct height um, as well as widening it a very small amount. The great thing about the notch that, that this file creates is it ensures that the string doesn't bind. So you can hear I'm testing it to see that it's still above, uh, you know, above the mark. And that just then like a little uh, the very gentle cut. So I'm being very, very careful because because it's such a nice, nicely fitted nut, the last thing I want to do is be pulling this out. That's very close to where I want it. Now at this point, I only need the, um, oh, let's bring you up here. Now uh, see, now I'm tangled up. Next thing you know, I'll be tipping over my remains of my cup of tea as well. Hello, what can you see? Well, see, the thing is about using this, it's all very well, and I'm, I do quite like it as a device to use, but I, I obviously I end, I end up having to, um, having to um, make adjustments on the fly. Uh, let's put that there, shall we? Right, stay still. I can't afford to move this setup at all. Okay, so that was the G string. Now I'm going to do the same with the B. It just isn't far off at all, just needs widening more than anything else. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start just by tilting back a little bit and just basically widening the slot more than anything else. Very, very small. Um, tolerances we're talking here. Now I've just then ran it across the front part of the slot very slightly just to widen that bit up as well. Um, it's very close but it's a tiny little bit higher still. me and then the slightly grimy pie the only reason this needs to be under tension is to um, just to make sure that the string sits properly in the slot um, it doesn't exactly exactly have to be perfectly in tune okay again so first thing is I'm just widening it first and then I'll do the lowering bit right at the end. Again, very, very, very small amounts of clearances. Um, I was speaking to somebody yesterday, or chatting with somebody yesterday, who was asking me about um, fret leveling, uh, not fret leveling, sorry, about nut slot adjustment. And, you know, he'd, he'd I think he'd bought a set of Hosco fret files um, and found that even though he was using, uh, uh, let's say, an 11 set, um, or no, not 11 set, a 10 set, his 10 gauge strings were still binding in when he came to string up the guitar. And it's something I've always found that it's kind of close, very nearly there. Um, it's something I found that. that even well, I had thought the Hosco ones would be better actually, but with the with a, a nut file, proper nut files inverted commas. Um, what I found was the because the front to back, the file makes a curved sort of curved um, thingy. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is slot, um, and as a result of that, it uh, it grips so you make a 10 gauge slot because it sort of wiggles a bit you um you still end up with a bit of gripping because 
it only takes the very slightest bit of wiggle to cancel out any clearance that your, let's say your 10 gauge set of files gave you, um, which is not good at all. And um, so I've kind of, I, I've yet to go back to him, but I, I really feel like saying, actually, oh, sorry, I did go. I, I, I wrote back yesterday, sorry. It was late, I forgot. But I said to him, actually, I can't find a reason not to do it like this. Um, you know, get the, use this file, this basic cheap file to get, get the uh, action down to where you want it. Um, it does the job really well. Now, obviously, there are those who might say, yes, but what about the pointy shape of this file in the bottom of the, the slot? To which your answer could be, well, if you really must, take one of your old nut files, which I have to say aren't much good. And if you really must do it, just make sure you round out the bottom of the slot with one of those files. And then lo and behold, it'll be where you want it. But, um, you know, my feeling is even if you don't do that, um, I mean, I tend to, when it gets to the size of the 53 or something like that, or this size, I tend to use the nut file at that point. But the problem with that is, is it, it's, it's still, it's trying to go down in the slot and it's trying to cut at only the bottom. And that's a real problem because it can't move. So it still really needs you to open up the slot with this file, or if you can't do it with that file, um, Use one of the other slightly roundy curved edged ones. This one's quite a good one. It gives you a sort of um, uh, ellipsoid shape. And actually, you can get quite a good shape of cut on that. And we're still a fair bit off there. So, um, and this one has a few different, it goes from thin right here down to thicker at the end. So you can actually, if you can reach, it's not so easy to reach on the, this one because the tune is in the way, but you, you can get quite a bit of good um, cutting out of it. And then, you know, but I, I, like I say, I, I tend to, I tend to leave, I use the uh, jeweler's file for most of it. I think I'm happy with that. Yes, so I I keep a set of these. In fact, I ought to go through and find one reliable set now because I don't really use them much other than that rounding out part of the game. But to be honest, I've done it without rounding out and I the guitars are played beautifully. Um, I'm only doing that just to assuage people's concerns if they think it, you know, you've got to have a certain shape. Right, so. Now, the thing, I wonder, I suppose I could do something down here. If I just jump with no power, I'm sure there's power in my phone, and oh, I need to get out of zoom mode. Sorry about this. This is terrible photography. Point one ish. One, no, one. One, thank you. Uh, just trying out different views, something like that. And I'm getting more bench and less guitar something like that right um okay so uh what i don't know about this guitar and it's a little bit difficult for me to tell because i don't i can't bend these 11s quite the way i would but not bad a little busy there cluster here. Yeah, that's borne out by this, choking out there. All right, let's get on. That's that's all I really need to know about it as far as whether it needs fret leveling or not, is at the action I've set it, do we have what I call fret slap? Yes, 
So we need to sort of help that along a bit. Do we have choke on bends? Yes, we do. Um, do we have fret buzz from high frets? Not, not massively, but there is, there is a little bit of, um, there is a sense of a high fret up there because we, we, we picked it up on bending the, the high E string across. So there's definitely a need for um, a level, but it's a sort of, I wouldn't say this has got a major league sticking up obvious high fret or sticking down obvious low fret. Um, this is in the more subtle realm of detecting the unevenness of the frets when it comes to um, when it comes to doing high bends or big bends on the high strings. And that's very often where it shows up. And so you, you'll see that it's the, um, the problem, the high fret is making itself known in the uh, G track. Now, the funny part is, is it's not just, that fret isn't just slightly high in the G track, but because the G track is at the top of a hill, effectively, when you're bending the string, and its anchor points are comparatively lower down, further down the hill. Um, it, the, as a result of that, the fact that the strings travelled down the hill cancels out any available clearance you had. So any tiny bit of unevenness will A, show itself up on choking on the string bends. And it will be B, B it'll be across all, the, all of the fret, but only really noticeable and only in a way we only need to tackle it on the the center part, because that's really where you do most bends. Um, and it's where the geometry is at the most extreme between this low point here in terms of the radius and this high point at the top of the hill. After that it goes downhill and you can't, you can't level your way out of that. You're constrained by the geometry at that point. Right, so I'm happy with that being as how it is. I'm going to use uh, the thin truss rod, the old Squire. Oh, squire truss rod for a change or not for a change for the first time in a few le -le levelings um, just because it feels like that so, some people kind of wonder what makes me make that decision um, and the answer is it's I feel it in my waters and that's about it really um, can't tell you it's just experience with it sometimes I I know I know how each truss rod adjusts and feels um, so I kind of know which one is suitable for the job, Intuit a bit intuitively. Um, so I just go with it. And it doesn't actually make terribly much difference either. Either one would do the job really well, but I just, uh, at that point in time, I'm feeling a bit more like this one today. So away I go, levelling the E track, as I call it. And the first thing I'm really going to do is just do some leveling and then I'm going to stop. And thank you, baby. I just want to stop. Yeah, stop and evaluate what it's done. And with this amazingly unplugged thing, I can fly you around and we'll do that tour of the frets. Uh, a bit too much shine going on. Let's look from the let's look from the side. Okay. Cutting, 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 cutting. Not much cutting, not much, not much cutting, not much, not much cutting, a little bit, not much, not much cutting, cutting. It's cutting everywhere. That's the first thing. So that tells me my uh, my calibration. Oh, crikey. Sorry about this. I've knocked all my little containers off the shelf. That tells me that my calibration of the truss rod is correct for that track. Um, but it also then reveals to me that there are a couple of low uh, frets up here. In fact, there's a couple of low ones here, which may be what are making this one, these ones here feel higher. So that could be a problem. So I'm going to just do a tiny bit more leveling and just focus my attention on this. What I'm deciding is a very slightly low pair of frets. And it's, I've said this before many, many times, but amazingly your low frets dictate the uh, what's possible as, uh, more in fact than your high fret so a high fret is easy to understand you know in that it sticks up and um, gets in the way of, you know takes away the clearance so that your your string buzzes when you fret it fret the note a low fret uh, 
that's the same thing, but for a different reason. So when you fret a note, fret a, when you fret on a fret that is in a ditch, or low down, um, what happens is that low fret in its ditch makes the next fret relatively high, even if it's actually the same, the next one is, is the same height as the relative to the rest of the fretboard. Because the one before it that you're pressing your string into is low down, the next one becomes high. And it, and it behaves like a high fret in that it causes a buzz or chokes off when you bend. Not bad, I'll do a tiny little bit more. In fact, it's very good, I'm just being picky. Um, the test will be the, the magnets everywhere. The test will be the uh, G track. Um, and what's good about that is that I'll be able to show you, you'll be able to hear with your own ears, as I used to say when I lived in Wales. Um, you'll hear with your own, your own ears, the choking disappearing, courtesy of the leveling process, which is a great thing. great thing and it's something you can't do with any other method which is why I like this method so let's just remember where we were right we were choking out that's even improved but we're choking out there so it's choking out right on this spot here and that's to the upside right on the top of the hill basically okay now my plan my my um, intention now is to show you how leveling this G track, but first of all, recalibrating the tool needs a bit more curvature in it at this point. It hasn't moved, or it could have moved, but it, it probably hasn't moved. There are slightly different levels of curvature at different points in the radius, amazingly. Um, this is now fractionally too curved. The amounts are so small you can breathe on it and it's different. That will just be right there. So now this is the telling bit. You should be able to hear in a minute when I've leveled this track, the G track with this calibrated rod, you should in a minute notice that bend choke either disappear or ease up. Now it may not go all together. And if it doesn't go all together, uh, it's because we it'll be choking as we go past the top of the hill, if you remember, the top of the very apex of the fret. And if that's the case, um, it means that with this radius we can't get we can't get that bend with that radius on that action. But Really, we don't want more than a, what is this? Tone and a half, isn't it? That's not bad, we're getting there. I'm gonna do a little bit, tiny bit more on this G. So we've got a tone and a half out of it. I think it might still, well, it will bend if I go over the hill. That's the point, because the geometry doesn't permit me to do that. As soon as I go over the top of the apex of the fret, then I'm going back down on the other side. And by definition, the top of the fret has to obscure uh, the clearance. It, it can't do anything else, but, so there is no way on earth you can level your way out of that because the fret is physically in the way of you clearance that you need to make the note play. So that's the limitation on bend. It's pretty good. So I'm gonna stop there. Ow, look at me bending 11s. What do you like? Well, so here we are under the 9th of April. And um, okay, need a bit more bend. Um, a weird day, as you many of you will remember, this being the day weird in such that you know when momentous things happen, it's always different from a normal day, even if you you're not a particular sympathizer with the the thing that's gone on. So today was the day that um, the death of Duke of Edinburgh was announced in 
this great Britain of ours. And uh, it's an interesting kind of one. I mean, first of all, what a good innings the man had. 1999 years, I think I would be, would be um, very happy if I could imagine having a 99 years a lot of life. Tiny, tiny, tiny bit up there, which I'll just do. Um, yeah, so kind of 99 years, great innings, as they say, and uh, but just momentous, you know. That it's one of those things where you realise that some somebody has shared the planet with you for all of your life. Um, not that you know you knew millions of us existed and all the rest of that isn't the point. Um, but you know, it's like when you see people you grow up liking musically when they die and you think, oh, they're gone and eventually not not long before I'll join them um, in the relative scheme of things. But then I was uh, I was reading some of some news news app bits this morning at the same around the same time. One of them was uh, uh, a few articles about Yusuf, um, Yusuf, what's the name, Malala Yousafzai, the uh, schoolgirl in Pakistan who was, was it Pakistan or Afghanistan? Oh my goodness. <gasps> Third man were where? Pakistan. Anyway, um, she was shot for blogging about and supporting education for girls. And uh, she's, she's now about 22 years old. And, you know, had she just, you know, by a fraction of millimetre of worse luck, she would have been dead and that would have been the end of her story. And as it was, uh, she uh, was lucky and survived. And uh, yeah, it's just a weird thing. And you, you kind of, uh, I started the day looking at a story that somebody hated somebody so much for promoting a cultural difference um, that they felt that the right thing to do was to kill her at age, what was she, 17, I think? Or no, she, was she even 17? Maybe she was, yeah. You know, to, to, to deprive a child of life. What a horrible, horrible thing. Anyway, and uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, we all, we all go and COVID has given us all a, a look into, many, many people are looking, a closer look into that than they would have liked. And, um, you know, Prince Philip had his 99 years. Thankfully, Malala got more than 17 and hopes she'll have many more. Um, Right, well, so here we have the fret leveling done and I'm happy with that. We've got a, a tone and a half bend at this new low action. Won't get any better than that. So my thing to do now will be to remove these here strings. They've done their service. Um, one thing, by the way, um, Josh, your strings aren't on enough. This isn't enough. I know it's a good idea to try and minimize the amount of string, but I pulled them literally in stretching them. I was able to pull them back off the pegs a little bit. So I don't think that technique, I'll show you at the end how I do it, but it's, you need a little bit more than that to hold them on. Um, and providing, providing, although like I said, it's a good idea to minimize the amount of slack kicking around on the strings, it, providing you, um, you, where's the cutters? Not an echo in the bunny mill song. Um, no, it wasn't. It was something else. Anyway, um, yeah, providing you, you can put a couple of winds on the way I will show you at the end. Um, and providing you uh, stretch them thoroughly, that won't be a, down, a negative. You'll get all the slack out. This way, I mean, you, you might have stabilised these. 
Um, but I, like I say, I, I pulled them. I spent a, a half an hour, hour playing this and I pulled it out of tune so many times. And it's clearly these strings have been on here for a long time. So it's not like they should have been venting or leaching out all of that detuning through the slack. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do here is Stop it, Joe. You? I lost everything. Now I lost everything. Are you still running? Oh my god, I've left my stupid soldering iron on. Oh found it didn't come up and burn myself, although it's trying to heat up the uh, press. Right, anyway, right this second, that is what I wanted. What did I want it for? Oh yes, I wanted it for replacing this little fella. Uh, arguable, debatable, whether this um, would benefit from two or not. Uh, I'll put one on. Two changes the you know the headstock a bit. Obviously, it's a it's a bit of a permanent uh, modification. Um, it doesn't strictly need it, although sometimes you look at the you look at the G and it's so much higher up than the others. It kind of makes you wonder how they can be that different. Oh, I see, we get three all the same length on this set. They usually give you a short one and two long ones. And now they've done three long ones. Oh well. I mean, they're not that long anyway, but they normally don't do it. Now, I'm just looking at this. This is a fraction uh, wider no, that's the same width I would use. Okay, pilot. Just checking the pilot size. Pilot size. I'm making sure it's okay. Okay, let's keep this one put away for another day. Yeah, um, anyway. Yeah, so one of those weird days today. 9th of April, 2021. Where well, I could have left my, so I wouldn't have left the soldering on all night because I switch everything off when that rack, when I go, but um, it, it might have caught fire while I wasn't looking or something. Actually it does, it gets too hot. That's the old soldering iron that I like to use when I need to put some heat quickly into the pot top. Um, and my new uh, soldering iron is not very good at it for some reason. Uh, it worries me. It takes, seems to take a long time to heat up. So I have the old one on in order to do that part quicker. But anyway. <laughs> uh, right, so what do I need to do now? I need to now remark up. Remarkable. Let's find out the, what's the view. Yeah, we'll keep this view for a Well, while we're in this mode, I'm going to remark, remark. Uh, the fret tops and this is now so that I can reprofile or recrown the frets whichever way you like to call it so that um, if any if I put any flat surfaces on them in leveling which I will have done to some degree um, this is about reshaping them so that they keep the same height but they um, are more arch shaped which is how we want them um, now, if you're doing a maple neck and you're not confident using a marker pen or whatever, it probably makes sense to uh, mask it off first. Um, I'm used to doing it, so uh, I don't don't make mistakes like that. Okay, so I'm going to now recram the fret, and the aim is to file and with this um, concave file until I've taken the uh, sharp edges of the flat spot inwards towards the middle but I don't want to go right to the middle I want to 
stop and leave a little strip of pen down the center of the fret. And that's a good way of telling me that I've reshaped the fret um, as much as possible, but without um, changing the height of the top, which is, as I say, probably about 2,000 or more times now since I started doing this, probably more, um, which tells me I have not upset the nice leveling work that I did earlier or just now, which of course you don't want to do. You don't, don't want to hammer away with this fret and change all the relative heights of the frets. Now the thing that I didn't say in this leveling but I've said years ago um, and in other places, the reason this method is a good one, uh, the reason I use it, I'm not saying it's better than anyone else's, or the reason I continue to use this method faithfully is that unlike other methods, because this one levels the frets with the strings on, it does a couple of unique things. And the first one is that it, it levels the frets, relatively speaking, while the neck is loaded under tension in, the, in a squeezed direction, not just curved, but compressed by the strings. No other, well, put it simply, you can only do that if you've got the strings on because even when you're just putting gauges under and you know pushing the neck into different shapes, you're not reproducing or mimicking or replicating the longitudinal squeezing of the neck that the strings impose on it. And it does make a very slight difference, but it's not a massive deal, but it's a very small difference. But I, I like that additional accuracy. Um, obviously, one of the most important reasons why this is beneficial way of doing it you saw earlier on or you, yeah is that I don't have to level to some arbitrary point or some absolute levelness like with a fret where the fret rocker tells me that everything's perfectly level um, because there is a degree of unevenness that doesn't matter as long as it lives underneath your target action right if you you don't want to just take away fret metal for an arbitrary mathematical levelness that you're never going to play to. You only need it to be level for the action you've chosen. So that's why I set the action first, no matter what it does to the playability of it. And then I make the frets comply with that action by using this process. Um, but because I'm only leveling to a set action and I stop because I can hear it when it frees up the sound, I can then stop without going any further. Um, and therefore it saves on fret metal. And I think that's a pretty elegant and sensible thing, particularly when you think that fret metal is fret life. And, you know, it's as simple as that, really. So uh, I think it's a great method, great system for that reason as well. Okay, now I'm just going to brush off some of the, um, the dust that's on here. Um, we'll, I will, what I won't do is I'm not going to make with the... Um, naphtha just now because what I'll do is I'll wait until uh, I've got the neck the fingerboard all taped up now this is an interesting one <sighs> the only guitars I've ever had a major problem with in the past uh, in losing their finish has been Fenders American and maybe some Mexican one uh, it seemed to be a period of time when they had a problem with the finish is ad adhering to the, or not adhering to the, um, the wood. Um, so long as you never got a chip or a break or anything, it tended to stay together. But as soon as you um, can level the frets and put a piece of sticky tape of any kind on it, um, you, you found it just flaked off this finish. Now, there's no way I can polish these frets out without um, masking them off. There, there is, thanks a little fly. There is a, there are little devices called fret protector strips, which I've got kicking around in here, but this isn't one actually, but I've got one somewhere. Um, but I actually find them very difficult to use um, and you can't do the full sanding out process. You can only do a sort of a fret rubber version of a, of a clean out. And because we've done this with 300 grit, um, fret, uh, 300 grit file marks or and 400 grit 
300 grit file and 400 grit paper to do the leveling we need to be able to sand out first not just work with a fret rubber so i'm afraid we're going to have to take the risk of doing it i did the other one this way it's modern enough that it didn't have a problem so i don't think we're going to have a major problem but i'm always kind of on the standby that if i need to then you know it may be as soon as i one one in a thousand it's happened to me and i have to re refinish the, the neck on it but um it's one of those horrible things but you can't really do anything about it uh, if you want to polish out the frets properly now uh, while i'm here and before i kind of go off to do the or change around to do the um fret sanding i'm going to take the bridge off because remember i said one of the things i'm going to do is uh, clean the components give it a clean as well as cleaning the um pit guard as well which is you saw me starting to clean it up but it's a bit mucky so we'll clean all that up and make it look as new as possible when it goes back um, now this this means that the i'll need to double check the action of all of the saddles again at the end because moving them at all is will that you know we set them such a precise height that moving them will cause them to change height so there will be a need for resetting but that'll only take a couple of seconds um, and it's fine because we already know that we've leveled the frets down to the target action so we know we can always go back to that action without needing to do anything else without any further work being required okay so just taking all these out we'll take the bridge off we'll take the plate off and we'll uh, take the knob off and we'll then shift the, uh, the scratch plate across to the soldering bench. Put that on there. Wrong one. Yes, so April 9, 2021. Kind of still in a sort of lockdown. Not really sure if we are or not. We're being careful as always. Um, went over to see my dad and stepmom today. Sitting outside, um, having a cup of tea in their garden, and he's he was sat out there underneath the. Uh, what do we call it? A waterproof shelter that I built for him. So that was the first time I'd seen him um, sitting under that, which is great. Small, please. Thank you. Uh, no, not that one. That one. Possibly that one. Oh, this one. Yeah. So we got to. It was nice to have a, a cup of tea and uh, sit and chat, chat for a while. I mean, first of all, we were outdoors. We were also we were there, support bubble as they call it. Um, and also, we've all of us had the vaccine. In fact, my dad and my stepmom have had, it, had both versions, so that's good. Both versions, both shots, I should say. Okay, so um, I think I may do I may do the wiring tonight. Let's have a look. What is it now? No, I'll do it tonight. It's five past nine already, so I'll probably do it tomorrow. Um, what I probably should do is do the, oh, hello, that's very cute. Okay, that goes to there, that's the bridge ground. So I better cut, cut a couple of these off. I never have the, I never have the soldering iron over here. So I, I tend where we get to this stage, I tend to cut this, um, 
bits off because there's so much spare wire here. We can always put that back together again or re reattach it, I should say. There's the one, and there's the other bike. So, neck pickups BHK, bridge pickups BHK. Who makes those? Is that a fender, fender type sticker? Oh, that's interesting. This is appears to be in the correct direction. So, nah, maybe it should be diagonal. Judging by that, that's in the correct alignment. I, I always thought it was up or down or front or back. But if let's leave it like that. If that's, it looks like that's the biz. Okay, so we've got we're going to replace um, replace this one with the humbucker. Uh, the way this is arranged is that the both pickups go to the switch, out of the switch, back through one of these wires here. This one, oh no, did I cut? I must have cut that. That's not clever. Da, da, da. Note to self: reattach that one. Comes back to there. Oh, this is the output. Yep, to there. Uh, cross to the tone output to the switch. Fine. Yep. So we're going to hook up the Seymour Duncton. I'll do that over here tomorrow. Right, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll call that. We'll do the um, polishing out bit. This will be off camera anyway. We'll do the polishing up, polishing out of the fingerboard. And that involves the, oh, taking the risk with sticky tape. And there's nothing I can do about it. Well, well, the only thing I can do, which is what I will do, is I'll do my best to take the tape. Let's see where we're looking, oh yeah. I'll take the tape and, um, I do my best to just de-stickify it a bit so that we have a uh, you know, relatively little grip, maybe enough to protect it. So that's the best I can hope for. But it's um, yeah, it's a, it's an unknown quantity. It's happened. It's happened to me only on fenders and only on fenders. I th I have a feeling it was U.S. But it's certainly North American. Um, it wasn't only on the Japanese one, it seemed to be a North American and a problem. I think it was only USA ones, but I could be wrong. So I'll do my best to minimise the pull, but we do need to protect it, otherwise we can't get the whole thing cleaned out, cleaned up and send it back. Okay, so this will, this will be, I'll do this now for the next 45 minutes and then I'm off home. And we'll pick up with the fitting the humbucker uh, tomorrow and complete tomorrow. Okay, see you in a bit. Shame to turn off the old internet monkey key edge. But we, we have to get on with doing these here things. So we've got two things going on in the world at the moment. Three things. One is I'm making a cup of tea. The other one is out in the other room. I'm doing my first ever use of that room. It's a bit cold, but it's not massively humid. It's been a very dry few days and it's staying dry at the moment, although it's cold. Um, oh shit. <clears throat> but it allows me to whiz through to the other dimension, the other room. And in whizzing through to the other room, uh, I can spray some primer. Some Primer, high build primer, which is mighty cool. Now, I went and chopped something off here, so that's me. Um, I've got to fix that first. So let's take care of that. I cut off the uh, ground wire off that, and I'll, uh, I suppose I'll let us plug in the ultra high heat transfer device, otherwise known as a shitty old Draper um, soldering iron. It's said in his best. Jana. Um, so, we're going to, yeah, so anyway, um, they're having fun out there, spraying some primer in the freedom of a big space. I don't care how it looks at the end, um, and it, I can sort of blow spray anywhere I like, and it'll clear out overnight, and it'll be good.
gone by the morning. How wonderful. Okay, so the first question I've got is will the Seymour Duncan be in or out of phase with yonder Fender pickups? And that's something I can never tell. I never can tell. Um, but I might be advised to go and look it up or have a look and see if I can find some reference to it. This is tangled up as usual. Yeah, I might, I might find some reference to it. I might not. Um, right. Yeah, is it or is it not? Is it in or is it out of phase? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this one off here first, which is the output. Sorry, the input. Uh, input to the switch. And I've basically probably need to just cut it back a little bit. Um, I've got tons of room, so I'll just make it make it easy on myself. So we want push room in there. Right. Um yeah, so in or out phase, we don't know and we won't know until I have had a chance to look. And at the worst comes to the worst, we'll find out the hard way by putting it together and then discovering that it's in fact out of phase and we have to switch them around, but it'll be a fairly straightforward business. And the thing I have to watch out for, or be careful to do with this is Although we're not using any switching, it's just going to be a straightforward humbucker use in this case. Um, we just have to be conscious of keeping the bare wire separate from the black one. Because that needs to remain grounded, even if we switch the other one round and interchange the hot and the earth um, because of the phase issue. So I've been caught out like that in the past where... I I didn't realize that was a necessity. Um, but once you kind of know that, you you don't get caught out. It gets a little bit complicated when you've, you've got a whole load of complex switching going on um, because you, you really need the, um, the bare wire and the earth wire. They've definitely got to be separate at that point. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to Oh no, for a minute, I'm not going to replace it. I'm just going to let this thing get hot. The reason I'm not going to replace it is it's going to sit there. And actually, I need, I need, I want to get to the top here. Okay, so let's, let us undo this small amount of cable tying. And we'll take out the bridge pickup. The bridge pickup goes earth there. And it's, in this case, it's the white lead to here. We're going to go to the same place on the switch, but we're going to um, we're going to have to cut this because I don't think we're ever going to get that dis in disentangled. So there's our bridge pickup being removed. Now we're going to. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what you can see in this in this ever-changing world. The pickups makes me give in and cry. Let me lay it down. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Sort of thing. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. Da -da. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So well, we still don't know and we can't decide yet. So I'll put the I'll place the pickup on board first. And then I will have a look at the potential of Fender pickups versus Seymour Duncan in or out of phase. And uh, sometimes now these Seymour Duncans are a little bit too big to go through here. <laughs> look at that. Will you look at that? Yeah. That is squeaking. Well, not so much, not so much. Let's try. Try, let's try getting there. So we might just, I don't want to be having to um, cut away at the scratch plate. I mean, it's not too difficult to widen it. 
Uh, we're in. That's good. Lovely then. Now this won't need to stick up anywhere near as high as the other one because it's going to be a fat punch. Okay, so this thing clipped together um, somewhere. I can't remember exactly where it clipped together, but it was something like that. And we will do well to do the same. Uh, if I look around here, I see that well, we've got the bridge and it comes sideways, sideways above, above is above and below, beyond and beyond. Down the middle is necessary, of course, and then over. What we really need is this to come central to this. That's the problem. We have a little bit of room underneath the bridge pickup, but not a lot. I'm going to try and use a cable tie first of all just to make sure that this neck pickup stays central there you go that's my attempt at doing that <laughs> and uh, we will get another little cable tie and then this time now we've got a thing here which says we've got a load of little spare wires I don't know why you can see that tons of spares and we know that with the do we know that with the Seymour Duncan, the red and the white and the Seymour Duncan are usually the usually the uh, coil split pair? If I can just get this out. What it won't help us with is the connection or the relationship to the fender ones. But uh, I love how they do this. All the things they don't actually tell you what the colours are. <laughs> Alright, red and white are I've worked out are the coil split pair. I think pretty sure of that from other times. So these already come un unconnected. So red and white will connect together and make the coil split pair. That's the first little undertaking we'll do. And then we will have the green will be live or ground, whichever the way the phase has to be. That's one of the things that really amazed me when I first figured out, or first made sense to me, um, that on your pickup, your pickup of it in and of itself doesn't care which wire is you use as earth or you use as hot. In fact, you know, as far as the pickup's concerned, there's no there's no basic difference there of the same thing. Um, or, Put it this way, put it simply, that a pickup will work if you wire it one way and make one wire out of two, assuming there's two wires. If you make one wire the hot and one wire the um, earth, it'll work perfectly well. And it will work exactly the same if you switch that around. That's assuming we're talking about a pickup on its own. It makes a difference when, it's, when you consider it in relation to other pickups. And so if you had two Seymour Duncans and you decided that in your world, of, your world of pickups, um, you wanted green to be hot and black to be earth, you'd have to make sure the other one was the same. On a two humbucker guitar. Because if it wasn't, you'd be starting out with them out of phase with each other. And that would present problems because you'd get that thin out of phase tone when you didn't want it. Right, so just having a look here, we've got all of these things. Um, now, interestingly, this is the difficult thing about this type of setup because we need one of these. I shouldn't really have done that. We only need one of these to go to the um, switch up here, and it's going to be this green one. But the others need to go down here, or if we need to switch it around, it needs to go the other way. So let's do the let's do the check first, shall we? Hmm. Um, yeah, that's that is the problem. We we need these really. We need these. We need this stripped right back. To be, if I'm being really honest, but it's a lot of stripped back wire. So let's assume. Nothing. Let's just do a quick check. I'll 
I'll just hang in there a minute while I go to the internet. And let's see if we can find, what are we looking for? Fender wiring codes versus Seymour Duncan. <laughs> uh, color translation, of course it probably won't even mention if, if and certainly it won't mention um it's not gonna mention the bloody single coils, is it? So it says on uh we have a fender, it goes yikes, north start, north finish, green, white, white, black, south start. So fender, the coil split pair is if it's a humbucker, it's white and black, leaving red and green as the things. So that that's sorry, white. It's black and white is the coil split pair on the fender and leaving you the red uh, red as the end and the green as the start. But that doesn't relate to single coil and we still have the risk of being out of phase. And I know for a fact I'm not going to be able to hear it until I've got it wired up. And quite frankly, that makes an absolute something out of this setup here. I've got all of this wire doing nothing useful. At best, I'm going to end up switching the these two colours. Um, so if I tie this up here, let's keep that one just to there. That's a bit of a naff setup, I have to say. Now, have we got any room to the left, sorry, to the right of these? Yeah, also a little line goes between the switch. There's a tiny space up there. Switch there. Switch fits in there. Below the inside of the switch comes to here. <laughs> Try and get it to stay somewhere manageable. Okay, so Let's begin with the default. We've got no other choice, really. So first of all, let me take off this pile of stuff on the surface of these pots. Just get rid of the old stuff. This thing's got a lot of heat in it, so it's melting the tip of the iron. Still going? Yeah, just about. I don't know, maybe it's not. Maybe it's refusing to put heat out. Blimey, come on. This is useless. I can't seem to get heat out of these soldering irons. I love more money. The iron the plastic hang, handle is heating up like nobody's business. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. The plastic comes off. Now we try and get the tin wire off. Come on, off you come, off you come. Oh my god. It's so much like hard work, I can tell you. Good, right, there's that bit. So let's go, first of all, through Festival. Through. We'll use this one while I've still got it in my hand. We'll go through here. Page out. Really not, not the easiest of irons. Let's change the other one just to get this on properly. That's, that's rough. 
rubbish. I've caught, I've done that thing where you catch the plastic and burn the plastic instead of soldering the damn wire in place. Come on, just make a proper joint, thank you. Right, so we're saying, what are we saying? Oh God, we've got to go up north. Right, we're going to go, yeah, we may have to, right, I was going to, I was going to make several, I'll put these two on the same blob of grounding solder, but actually I can't because I have to probably unhook one and not the other if it's out of phase. So I'm just, I, I built a, um, I built myself a little stringed instrument so that I could, a little <laughs> one stringed piece of wood so that I could uh, test how to phase, but I haven't seemed to have much great success with it yet. So actually I need two grounds. This is getting silly. Let's put this one on first. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry about the angle here. I can't really reach this very well. stay on there. Thank you. Now we're going to go, we're going to go, let's go, we'll go bare to the middle, bare to the middle. So you can hold that in one spot. Bare to the middle. Thank you. And then we'll need another So we're saying green, to begin with, we're saying green is going, running back up to the switch. So to begin with, we'll put the black to the top of the pot in the hope that this is right the first time. But in full awareness, it may in fact, may well not be. Okay, so, Basically, to run this green bag up here, we're now going to have to elongate it. Get some, some handy green. I've created a nugget of purest green. And so the thing is, if this don't work, then I'm going to have to separate these two and switch them over. So in a way, I don't really want to overcomplicate this with like shrink, shrink wraps and all that sort of clever stuff that one might otherwise do if one was going for a permanent fixture. But we can't really be assured of that yet. Anyway, so I'm just tinning these up one to go through the, sorry, one to go through the switch and one with a bit more solder blobbed onto it to join with this other thing down here. Now, of course, because it's going to be a hot or a live hot, yeah, plus, plus one, uh, it's going to need, it's going to need to be shielded. So I'm going to have to shield it. And if it's out of phase, I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and redo it. No real choice. One. Now this comes off here and we're going to double this back to here. We need a little bit of, small bit of, um, hmm, a little bit of a thing that's called shrink wrap, but a very small kind of shrink wrap. In fact, I don't think I'll actually get it together if I have this great blob of stuff on there. So get rid of the blob first. Try and put the shrink wrap on. Mind you, it's a silicon wire, so it's not going to work. Yeah, that's no good. I don't really think I've got an awful lot else knocking around. It's much thinner. For the red stuff here. So maybe purple, maybe a small bit of purple. I might just do. Really short on good quality varieties of shrink tubing. 
So this is going to help protect it from grinding out on anything. Um, but I'm so so much here is banking on it being the right connection. Now, what I don't have at this point in time, well, I can actually, just one second, I can afford to load this with a bit more, um, a little bit more solder now because I've got thicker shrink tubing in the game. So if I do put a bit of loading on here, it makes connecting it up with the other one a lot easier. Since I can only really hold one at any one time. I suppose you could say I've got the, whatchamacallit, the arms, the helping hands to help me. But I find it easier to just do that. Right, there's our first connection. We've got our output there. We've got our two earths separately grounded there. We've got our little bit of shrink wrap, shrink tubing to come down there and protect that. And then we've got, we might as well connect it up because it's still just a big deal. If, if it works, then I don't want to be taking it apart again. But if it doesn't work, well, we'll have to take it apart again. Uh, I think I'll probably end up having to put a single string on it and testing it. I don't want to waste a set of strings. So well, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to, you may be able to see what I'm doing here. You may not, sorry. I'm just trying to keep all of these strings a little bit tidy so that they don't get caught under the, um, under the scratch plate and they stay reasonably well out of the way. Now, if I want this shrink tubing to work, I obviously have to fire some hot air at it. It's about as good as I can do. So that's my, oh, I see, look, that's hmm, sticking out baggy at the bottom here. I really don't want that. So I can extend this, pull this up through here a bit. Hmm. Come on. You can do it, you can do it. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah, All right, let's put, got them out. I'm lay, laying on these here thingies now. It's gonna be a real pain if it has to change over. Okay. Okay, so that, my little chickens, is about as good a, an arrangement as it's gonna get. Uh, jack, everything. Ooh, what moved? Oh yeah, the jack moved. That's right. I was going to do that up again, wasn't I? So that's spun right the way around into an unhappy, unhealthy position. So let me just go and get the uh, adjustable spanner. We've got a bit of thread lock, which I intend to use. And uh, we'll use that to hopefully stop this spinning around any further. thing's also got plastic from the scratch plate film on it which I hate right so all the way around here keeps it taut I suppose I'll have to go with that right bit of the old sealy I just think of all the things that are going to move this the uh, the, the Jack socket is the first victim of movement. It, you know, it, it doesn't like being wiggled around the way it gets wiggled around in the operation. And it's destined to be put under pressure because of the laws of physics, really. Um, so if we give it a, a head start and help it stay in place with a bit of the old locking stuff, it would be better for it. I got that set. 
Okay, this is all right in place. It's in the right position. There we are. Uh, pick up some gunge. Uh, let me see, have we got, do we have that little device for testing or is it back in the shed? It might be in the shed. Uh, spring thing for testing. We're going to have to make another one. I mean, I could try it with the, the uh, iron, no, tuning fork. Tuning fork is sometimes a good way, but I'm not entirely sure that it's going to tell me faithfully if the uh, bass tone disappears. I'll try it. See now, I've got a bad feeling. That seems to be a fair drop in uh, bass component of the sound. Should we try? Let's try spinning this around. Let's give it a go. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically take that one off there, like this. We're gonna have to extend the other one. So green needs to, well basically needs to go to the, go to there, and the black one needs to extend to the other direction. So let's just slip it free and cut it back a little tiny bit. I think, if I can't tell the difference on this, attempt, then I'm going to have to put strings on and find out the, the very much hard way. Oh, this is such a flimsy little connection. Um, I suppose I could leave this. Let's try it first and then we'll see. So we're going to first of all start by attacking the green and I'll shorten this. If I if I get it to work in situ, then I'll just go ahead and tidy it up. And it's just a quick way of trying it out. Now, when I did the... Um, hmm, I could be wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong. Oh, well, I'll find out the odd way. Let's put this to the, to the top for now. See, look, this soldering iron just doesn't like to shift enough heat. Maybe this one. Right. So now we've got to run this one up to the top. We'll do the same thing with a little bit of, we'll use red this time. there along along the same track as the other one so we can cable tie them in to keep them tidy if it figures out if it doesn't work out then I can still get back up there with the green if it's distinctly not this way around then I'll know I could have done it with test cables I probably should have just done that instead but I was it's kind of got past that point now I'm into the I've already wasted time position Okay, first one through here. We shall see. I'm 
sort of going on the basis that I'm treating it as if that's the way I'm going to go. So if, if we get this far and it is this way around, then I don't have to mess around trying to tidy it up later on. Okay, so we need a little heat shield, shrink, heat shrink shield. We need a bit of tin on this wire. Tiny little bit of wire. I actually can't get, cannot get a piece of solder to stay on it. I'll make do with the, make the connection with this bit. Ow. Now, technically, before I heat shrink, I should be able to just connect that up and do a test this way. Burp. Now, I want to hear. Damnation, I can't do it. difficult until I can hear the tone of the, the actual strings. That sounds about right. Listening for the bass part of it, I can't really make it sound any bassier, but um, I am just listening for that. I want the bass to be there in the in the middle position. I think this is the right way around. That's my theory, and if I'm wrong, I shall pay for it the hard way. Right. So there's my new connection. Um, this now is unnecessarily over long. Um, I will be better off. Oh God, let's do this. I don't really want to do that. I was going to cut it off. Uh, but if I do and I have to change it later, then I'm still going to be in the, up this creek. So I'm going to leave this little extra join on here. Nobody's going to care about it. It's going to be hidden neatly out of the way. Let's load up a bit of solder on there. Damn you. That's it. Take off this one. And turn the other one over on top of it. Come on. You onto there. You onto there, please. Thank you. Now I've lost grip of my pliers, which then everything becomes impossible to press down. Okay, so that's that one grounded back there. Now we'll do the little heat cover up. One more time, I hope. Jeez, ow, I just gone burn my finger on the damn dram dram draper. Tss, singe. Right. Last couple of Thing, cable ties, but I'm running out of them actually. Last couple of black ones, keep this as tidy as we can. And I trust this will be what we need. Um, I think we've also got a hook together 
uh, the, yeah, we've got to hook up the, um, what's that one? The earth, the shield, earth, shield ground next in a minute before anything else. Okay, you sort of sit over there like that. You go like that. I think that will do. Hmm, the smell of burning fingers. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move these things off to one side. Wash it off the surface here for a minute. So we've got, yeah, we've got the bridge. We've got two ground wires to hook up here again. So we'll just take, um, get a bit of bare, bare wire off these. They're a bit stiff, these wires. They're not like my nice silicon wires. <laughs> and technically, we could just coil these together. It'd be easier. One's a copper one, the bridge earth one, and one's a steel one, the ground, ground earth, if you get what I mean, the ground ground, the shield earth. So just loading both of those up with some nice blob of the good stuff. And then the idea is to figure a way of bringing this over here and setting it down on top of there with the big hot iron of doom. What I really want is to put a bit of a little bit of solder on this pot to begin with. Would you behave, please? Would you do as you're told, please? Thank you. And voila. Let's switch this evil soldering iron off done its duty including melting me in the process okay so there we have grounded grounded by the light I can try and there's too much that's the problem with this it's too much ground wire floating around look at this and it's everywhere and it's, it doesn't really want to sit tidily in any cavities <laughs> nor does this one <laughs> get in there right okay Everything good, everything good, everything good. Okay, um, let's get the thingies, those scratch plate screws, and we'll put those in. And after that, I will do a little bit of off camera cleaning. Um, we've got to change this pot as well, but that's fine. Do a bit of off camera cleaning. Um, the bridge needs doing as well as the surface here as well I'll give it a polish but first I will zip into the other room and do another coat of primer acrylic primer difficult to do this because the, the wire sort of wants to tuck in a hole as well and not touch the bridge. Uh, 
Uh, well, I can't really, I'm putting all these screws back in on the assumption that I think I've, I think I've guessed it right. <laughs> if I haven't, I'll still have to take it all apart again. Um, but I'm going to put, once I've got the bridge back on, I'm going to put one screw, uh, one string on and test it. Um, and then, assuming I'm happy with that, then we'll go ahead. Right. That's good, that's good, that's good. That, that needs to come off anyway, because it's wobbly and it's got plastic stuck under it. Right, let me go and do the cleaning of the bits and I'll come back to you in a minute. The container, there's the thing. Right, be with you in a second. Let's just put this safely out the way, which is not what I'm currently doing. I'm making a pig's ear of things. Here is the original pickup, string tree, no, not string tree, original screws, things. Uh, where's the container? Right, it goes in there with the other spare parts. Uh, right, so now we're on the final stage, which is the restringing. And this we have a set of 11s, sorry, 10s. These are not 11s, they're, they're ultra slinky. So they're 10s with a heavier bottom end. So let's load them all up. Sorry if the view ain't so good. So these won't be quite as heavy as the ones that were on there. Um, I will have to make adjustments to the bridge since I took it apart and cleaned it and put it back on it will have moved the saddles all over the place so it's not going to be in the right set to the right action or the right intonation just yet but we'll take care of that in a minute I was just listening on the radio to a Radio 4 program kind of detailing the uh, Yuri Gagarin's trip into space back in the very old days when the thought of just a human being going up into space and orbiting our planet was the stuff of science fiction and beyond. Incredible the progress that's been made since we were, even in my day, you know, I, I was, I remember the moon landings and I remember my foster mum. Foster mum, yeah, that's what you'd call her. Foster mum took me to see it. I think I've said this before, but took me to a, I think her friend had a farm somewhere, not far from where we lived. But the important point was, it wasn't that she had a farm, but that uh, there was a television on the farm. Television, and of course you had to have a television to view the moon landings, because it was only on television in glorious black and white in fact it almost couldn't call it black and white it was so uh, faint and translucent okay so um, I think what I'm going to do and just let's bring this up here I want to show you something this was important uh, Josh for you I think I'm just going to check out the view a minute right so here we go so you didn't have enough wind on on these things um, it's really important to get a balance so what i recommend is you go pull the string all the way through grab it at the one fret behind so i'm grabbing it over the first fret and i pull it back a fret right and then i'm going to start winding and i'm going to hold on to this tight string and it's going over the loose string to begin with and as it comes back round, i grab it and i'm pushing it under the loose string which I pull up and then the two things kind of, well, the, the one locks the other off. It's quite a good little system. In my experience, this is as little as you need and it stretches out pretty well and it's very tidy and it won't run the risk of doing what your strings did uh, uh, the other day when I played this and pulled the strings, which was to give up all of that um, slack after, even after however many months these strings have been on. So. You don't want to be able to pull the strings off the post. That's not good. 
Um, so it's a good little system. This uh, it, it changes slightly how much goes onto the post as you go through the, the thicker strings um, to the thinner ones. Obviously, there's a different amount of string that goes around the post. But um, so hold it over the first fret when it's tight. Pull it back one whole fret. Start winding. Hold it taut. Direct the taut one over the loose one. And then as it comes around again, push the taut one under the loose one on the time as it comes around. And that's the lock. Found it's just a very useful way of doing it. Somebody showed it to me on a Facebook page, I think. And I liked the idea of it and did it ever since. Right, so after this, what remains is to stretch the strings and then intonate them, and uh, we'll be done. I was, as it happens, I was right, I think, in the uh, rewiring the other way around. Um, so it, if I'd have put it on the standard way or the same way, uh, it would have been out of phase. Kind of worth remembering. <laughs> I should write it down, but you know what? I don't because I'm too lazy, or I don't. I'm not organised enough to put it somewhere that I'll know where it is the next time. Okay, so tightens. Put it under pressure. Hold it over the loose one, and then down under the loose one. Around it goes. Right, all my strings, my 11s done. Uh, not my 11s, I keep saying that, it's 10s. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, let's put you over here. Let's change the camera angle. Sorry about this, just, it's very difficult to know what's going on. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start by giving the strings a bit of a tug to seat them in properly. Oh, yeah, you're up there. Um, obviously, when you're stretching, you've got to start to be a little bit more careful as you get up to the B and high E, so you don't want to be busting them. So, so I'm going to get the tuner, tunering fork. <clears throat> Then what you should do is to grab the strings and start stretching them between thumb and forefinger. And you basically, however you do this, you want to do this until there is no more detuning every time you tune up and stretch. And then when it's no, it won't detune any further, then you're spot on. You're in, you're in tune. Or oh, you're, you're stretched fully out. Um, and that's the way it works. If you don't do it, if you don't do this manual stretching, then you're gonna find that the, the strings give up their slack over months. A little at a time. <laughs> the action's right down on that one. do now is I'm going to just do reset the action since it's moved around. Um, I've obviously replaced some of the or switched some of the saddles around without even realizing it which is really 
silly. But I think that one is the low E and it's gone there instead. I might actually might need to switch switch it over. Well, I can't really now. Bugger. How did I not notice that? 1.2. This is the wrong bleeding. I think this is the. I have to switch these over. I think this is this a short one or is it not? Let's find out the hard way. Yes, it is slightly. Damn. Should have. Uh. The E, high E, and low E tend to have shorter um, thingies grub screws and these got mixed up so I'm switching them around if I can get it into place come on thank you the alternative would be to take the string off and take the saddle out and do it that way, but I don't think it's really a good idea. Let's just switch the grub screws over. Okay. Right, let's get back on track. Boom. Nearly there. That's what we want. One point five. Okay, one point five. Good. <sighs> That's the action. stretch and then we do some bends and the last bit of stretch out and then be on to the intonation part and that's that I also have to put the fit the knobs on Adam's beastie whoops and restring that one or string that one ready to go as well um, I suddenly realised that I've only got one carry case, so I can't take two guitars home tonight.
Okay, let's just uh, intonate the guitar. And I have to zip out and do a bit more spraying. I think the last one for tonight. Leave it to set dry and come back and maybe plan to do some uh, color tomorrow. So they're all showing up, those two are showing up as sharp. So I'm going to pull them back a little. And let's see what we got. So I'm going to do the whole lot in a sort of pattern from there, since I know that the first ones are too long. I can I can assume the others are as well. Okay, that's us done. Um, there we are. Looking at the um, the way that these are, even if I slack these off, they still make the scratch plate look pinched. Something about maybe the way it was always done up first from the shop. Um, but hey, okay. So there we have it. That is the Duo Sonic set up with the. New Seymour Duncan. Um, let me get all the fingerprints off it. Uh, have a quick uh, listen to how it sounds before we finish. Dust.
sound. Um, volume master down. Never quite figure out where this can see. Uh, sort of. <laughs> Not the best. Set up, check strap, make sure that it, it's safe. So here we have the different sounds, the
Dusted Lake. Thank you for watching um, the Duo Sonic with upgraded bridge pickup to a Seymour Duncan hot rail. Probably um, doesn't need to be quite so high up close to the strings to have kind of balanced it off with a bit more, a bit more um, signal or a bit higher string, a higher pickup position on the bridge. No, the neck. Uh, sort of give it a little bit more output balance up with the bridge but you never know it's a personal thing I thought that got a bit um, middly close to the strings so I think it was better okay. stepping it back a little bit but it's only ever a case of balancing up these two pickups to your preference there's no, there's no hard rule okay there we have it Ta -da. thanks for watching see you again <laughs>